Okay. So, overall, how's everybody doing today? Good. Just tired, what? but I'm enjoying my day off. I can't complain about that. <laughs> yes, it's in a, oh, yes. Okay, um, so, yeah, so welcome, everyone, back to the second podcast of ms Yep. It's crazy. My name is uh, Ryan Lim. What else do we need to say? I don't know. I'm a sophomore, too. Yeah, I'm Toby Lin. I'm a senior, too. And then I'm today. Patrick. And I'm an alumni. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for okay. coming, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, man. Sure do. All right. So before we talk about everything that's going on right now, I just want to, you know, start off with a simple question that we usually ask everyone. Patrick, uh, what made you choose nursing? Ooh, uh, what made me choose nursing? Um, well, I had my, my grandma who was, uh, she had a stroke. And then basically after that whole thing happened, she went to a nursing home, so it wasn't necessarily a hospital setting. Um, mm-hmm. But I just really appreciated, like, the – just seeing, like, the intricacies with the relationship between – that a nurse can have with a patient in the, mm-hmm. the sense that it's kind of, like, you're the person that's, like, pretty much in contact with them really mm-hmm. frequently. So I really liked that um, and also just the care that they gave for her. So that's why I did nursing. Mm-hmm. Was that a hard choice to make, like – when you were applying to colleges like were you debating on other majors as well or was like nursing always like a thing that you were like dead set on from no, the start? It, it, it wasn't actually um and to be honest it was i was in community college and in community college i was actually a physical therapy major um mm-hmm. but then i made the switch to nursing um after i kind of just realized well i i wasn't as interested in physical physical therapy as i thought i was mm-hmm. um so yeah, that's how I became, an, or that's how I ended up pursuing nursing, and then now here I am. Mm, okay, yeah. I find that interesting because, like, um, like because both Toby and I—I I don't know if it's for all nursing students, but Toby and I also had uh, some sort of exposure to the hospital setting mm-hmm. or to healthcare prior to choosing to become a nurse, and it kind of influenced us to choose nursing. Mm-hmm. I think that's just really cool. I think that's just really cool how a lot of us are able to, well, I guess it might be tragic in a sense that we all had to go through something like that in order to be exposed to nursing. Yeah. 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 Okay. But do you feel like it's a necessary thing? Do you feel like a lot of us have to be exposed to some of that in order to like realize like, oh, this is what I want to get into, healthcare? Yeah. No, I don't actually. And I think, well, My honest opinion is I think that you don't have to necessarily have like a particular reason Mm -hmm. to want to get into nursing. I think it helps because it helps you stay afloat, especially when you're like a new grad and you know, you, this is, this is your lifestyle. This is your work. This is what's providing the money, you know, and having some kind of a reason like that can help. I think, you know, as far as, um, making you not want to rip your hair out all the time uh, yeah you, know, you, you enjoy your job and you know uh-huh. why you got here you wanted to do it but um you know there's other people who didn't necessarily have the same kind of exposure as you know like oh like i had this experience when the hot in the hospital and like that's when i realized like you know like nurses are cool or whatever mm. um, i don't think it's necessary i just think it's um it's a nice thing to have but when you're on the job, when you're working, um, you know, you have to find, you have to find something to kind of pull from, I think, to mm. keep you going. It's like, oh, like, do I really want to go to work again? Do I really want to come back next week? And that, that part really does get hard. Um, uh-huh. sometimes, and I think especially as a new nurse, um, but yeah, having the reason helps, but I don't think it's necessary. And what was that motivation? Because I know like all of us at one point, uh, especially right now with what's going on in the world, I think a lot of the nursing students I've talked to are having a difficult time staying motivated at home and just focusing on their work. Uh, We're all trying to find a light at the end of the tunnel. But, you know, Patrick, Mm -hmm. you've been to the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of graduating nursing school. So Mm -hmm. how did you keep yourself motivated? Um, What kept me motivated was, I mean, I think it's really my friends um, and just keeping in touch with them. And, you know, when you have people, other friends who are also motivated to be nurses, like, you know, you kind of just share that mentality and that mindset. Um, Mm -hmm. So even if I like, like, let's say I was drawing away during nursing school and I was like, you know, I don't even know if I can do this. You know, I don't know if I'm still dead set on wanting this as a career. I still had friends who were there for me who 
had that motivation and I could draw from them, you know? And so you kind of mm-hmm. just lie on each other and um, keep each other going, even if you don't necessarily feel like you're doing a good job or like you're, you're still in with it or you're still passionate about what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, and that's even like, in, even at work, you know, sometimes when you get burnt out, um, having good coworkers, coworkers that are passionate or coworkers that, you know, you can just have, uh, good sense of humor with you know share a good time yeah. and you know talk with those that's what really helps a lot and keeps you on mm-hmm. track how about you toby um yeah i i think i completely agree with with what you've said about really just having that support system and so you know because you mentioned that um i think it's a good place to transition into you know kind of what has msns done for you you know since we're doing this podcast to really bring that support to people, you know, to help nursing students, you know, what has MSNS meant to you and what has it done for you as far as getting you through nursing school and even maybe even helping you beyond nursing school? Wait, sorry. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, like what, what is, um, what does MSNS, you know, kind of meant for you? Um, and what has it helped you as, you know, with getting through nursing school and maybe even beyond nursing school? So I think that the answer to that question is going to be different for everybody, but what MSNS did for me was kind of just, I I mean, guys in general were pretty much a minority in this profession, but it was really cool to have a media that like, you know, brought together all the different guys in nursing school um and so for me i guess what i notice now uh working as a nurse is it really kind of helped build the culture that i want to see on my unit Mm -hmm. so with msns it was you know bringing a bunch all the guys in nursing and kind of just um encouraging us to support each other and um, that's something that i want to see in our on our unit is like i want to see nurses supporting each other i want to see nurses who have each other's backs and nurses who I can trust. Um, with MSNS, it was cool just because, I mean, you you build the culture that mm. you want to see on your unit, and I think you start that in nursing school. Um, so MSNS was just a group that helped to provide that kind of a setting. Mm. Um, oh, so wait, Patrick, so you were on the e-board, correct? Can you tell me, like, yeah. what your position was? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was a vice president of 20... Um, oh God, I already forgot. I, <laughs> it's okay. I think it was, I can't remember if it was like for a whole year or for just a half semester because, um, I was a transfer student. So, but mm, I was a okay. vice president. Um, um so how was, uh, MSNS like when you were there? Cause like from hearing from stories of other people, yeah, I feel like it's drastically different or it's evolved since then. But can you tell me about your time in MSNS? Yeah, no, it was, it was, oh man, it was really fun. But, um, I think, a lot of it uh, when I was a student, it definitely, I definitely thought that it started out small. Um, and that's a lot of that has to do with just it being like the new, one of the newer nursing organizations. Mm-hmm. So for us, when we were on eboard, our, our challenge was like, okay, so like, how do we get students actually more involved? How do we get students to actually want to be a part of MSNS? yeah um and just how how do we like grow it you know how do we set that foundation so that you know down the line the future generations like they have like kind of like a a good mold to work around like okay cool this is how msns is how do we get new members and how do we keep members engaged Mm -hmm. um so for us i um i'm trying to think of like the things that we did um i think we started doing like study sessions and stuff um we also did um a part like a partnered event so like we did a barbecue in golden gate park and we did that with trigamma and nsa and that was really fun Mm -hmm. (laughs) um but a lot of it was really about um trying to think of the word like member um retain membership retainment or i don't Mm -hmm. know oh yeah no yeah but yeah um and it's really about like how do we make this group actually attractive um, mm-hmm. because, um, you, you want members to be in a part of you guys, um, 
and that's all a part about building culture. You know, you want to mm-hmm. get people into this group. You want to get people into this group who are motivated to be nurses. Um, and in that way, you know, you're just building a good support system. Yeah. And Toby, um, so like you were here for like the earlier stages of MSNS yeah. too, and then you kind of seen how it's progressed. Can you talk about how MSNS has really changed? Yeah, then? I think what's really amazing is over my four years to have actually been able to see the growth and evolution of MSNS. You know, from my freshman year, where you know back in 2016, where literally it was like ten of us in a ro- in a small room over. Um, in, in Count Manovitz. And then over time, it's really evolved and blossomed. Now we have what really close to 100 members with the majority being pretty active. Yeah. And to, so to just see, you know, um, with Patrick's yeah. group and the, the years before, everyone really putting in that work to set the foundation. And then now, once the foundation has been set, we've really seen it explode, especially over this past year, really with not only just membership but also with diversity right you know patrick you talk about building that culture of diversity and support of nurses and starting that early in nursing school so Mm -hmm. that when we get out into the workforce you know we're supporting each other our fellow nurses and healthcare professionals and so to see that not only do have we increased our membership and expanded msns beyond only accepting you know guys now we have everybody it's completely inclusive and we also have non-male members on eboard to really create that culture of diversity you know it's still about you know supporting males who are the minority in nursing but now it's how do we support each other and support other minority groups how do we just create a culture of inclusivity of support of positivity especially in a hard workplace Mm-hmm. yeah definitely do you guys have any concerns for msns like moving forward like do you feel like even though it is great that we are like gaining more people in the club do you are do you guys have any concerns about um in terms of like it being bigger meaning that we might lose some of maybe that tightness that we you guys might have had because it was only like a small group of guys or whoever and you guys were all really tight do you feel like we might lose that when we have more members oh that's an interesting question um (laughs) yeah i mean i guess that was kind of a benefit in in hindsight is just having a smaller group because it's kind of more intimate in that sense Mm -hmm. um but that's a good question damn (laughs) Um, i think i mean i definitely think it's hard i think it's harder for sure Mm -hmm. to um maintain a level of intimacy with a larger group um you know it's it's just because that means you there's more people that you have to connect with and that's a lot more personalities that you have to engage and include mm-hmm. um you know i don't necessarily it's a bad thing either um no yeah. every yeah because like every group uh, even even in the workplace every unit is going to have like their own like subgroups mm-hmm. um, that people kind of hang out within um but as long as like each of these little like kind of subgroups are all you know like coming together and still having that community exactly you know kind of just having the same mindset of like okay we want to like build a good culture Mm -hmm. we want to start a good culture here here while we're in nursing school and we only want to bring that once we actually graduate and start working as long as you guys have something to connect with something Mm -hmm. that will um interweave all the different groups little subgroups um that's important to have Mm -hmm. and do you guys feel like is there any pressure to ever change the name of the club because of how inclusive we're getting? Like, like a lot more girls are coming in. Do you feel like we need to, there's a need to change like the name of the male student nursing society at all? Um, I personally didn't really see a need to, at least not when I was a student, but I know that you guys are like, it's a lot, definitely a lot more diverse now. So I don't Mm -hmm. know. (laughs) <laughs> I actually don't know really what it looks like, but uh, at least when I was a student, no. How about you, Toby? Uh, yeah, that's actually been something we've talked about a lot with eboard um, in the meetings. Like, do we need to make a change? Is there a way we can change the name to have that diversity? Personally, I think that 
having the name MSNS really carries on kind of the legacy that was started, you know, mm -hmm. when the organization first came together. And really, this is you know, a big issue still <clears throat> of males in the nursing workplace. You know, it's st males are still the minority. There's still a lot of stereotypes and stigmas around a guy choosing to be a nurse and really dedicating himself into that workplace. You know, there's still organizations out there aside from MSNS that are trying to promote that, um, promote just and support, you know, get in the workplace. And we see it with, especially with rotations such as um, your maternity rotations or even working with female patients, you know, you do run into that problem. I know I've, I've run into that problem with clinicals where mm -hmm. I was denied entry even into a room. I didn't even, it wasn't even so much as talking to the patient. I wasn't even allowed in the room because mm -hmm. there's, you know, a discomfort with a male entering the room, not just with maternity, but just patients in general. And so there's definitely still a lot of work that needs to be done. But mm -hmm. I think what's also important is that not only are we promoting that aspect, but also promoting the diversity um, in the workplace, because it's not just male, there's a lot of minority groups in nursing that need to mm -hmm. be represented and that need to feel supported. And I think that that's at the core of what MSNS is trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And so I think as long as those core values are there, you know, the, the name is just a name at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's more important is what we really um, identify with and stand by. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like we're doing enough of that? Like bringing that voice of the minorities within nursing through MSNS right now? Like do you feel like, because I know we've had those uh, speakers that come in. Uh, mm -hmm. I forgot who he was. Like the one that I went to with you, Toby, last semester, mm -hmm. where he would talk about. Yeah, Dr. Like, Patterson. Yeah. Can you tell me more about him? And do you feel like we need more, whether or not we need more of those kind of speakers to come out to like, bring light to the situation of the world of nursing in terms of minorities? Yeah, I think that's definitely important. And also what I think MSNS does really well is bringing people like Patrick to be able to come back, you know, people who went through the program, people who were in MSNS and to be able to see where they are now after, mm -hmm. you know, after these four years and to see that, you know, they're doing it. And so we can also do it too. I think that's one of the most important things that MSNS brings is this connection with the, the alumni to be able to see just like, just that it's, it's okay. And that mm -hmm. it is, it is possible and that it is, and you know, it's, it's doable. And I think, um, you know, Patrick, you can probably talk more about just your journey and the, you know, obstacles and bumps you've faced along the way through nursing school, right? Yeah. I mean, just, nursing school's tough. I mean, there's no getting, <laughs> there's no getting around to it. Uh, yeah. I mean, junior two is like when that's that's when I really felt started feeling the heat. Um, <laughs> I uh -huh. remember for junior two Dayberg's class, uh, I was let's see I was like on a 70 I was like 8 percent in the class mm -hmm. um and that was pre Hesse, pre junior two HESI and also pre-finals so and I was I was struggling for most of the class um and then once the HESI was, was around the corner for that semester I was like so HESI was worth like, I don't remember how much it was. I think it was like 15% or something like yeah, that. Something Maybe like 10, that. 10, 15%, I don't know. And at that point I was like, okay, well, there's that. It's weighed 10 to 15% or there's the final for junior two, which was weighed like 30, some, something like 30%. <laughs> I don't yeah. I don't remember what it was, but it, it was, was like a high things. number. Yeah. yeah, it was a high number. And so I remember um, just thinking to myself like, well, damn, I mean, I want to pass for sure. Um, but obviously the final means a lot more than mm -hmm. HESI is going to mean to me. So I took a pretty, I guess, an orthodox approach to it. And I didn't bother to really study for the HESI aspect so much as I did for the finals. So I was basically purely studying just for the finals. Wasn't really doing like HESI type questions so much. Um, I was just studying Dayberg's like slides and my notes and like 
rewriting the PowerPoints just so it made more sense to me. And I mean, it ended up working out. Um, <laughs> so I took the, I took the HESI and it dropped me from a 78 to a 75 because I didn't really study for it. Also, my track record for HESI at the time was pretty trash. So that's why I also decided not to really study for it. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't really advise it, but anyways, that's what happened. Um, so I dropped from like a 78 to a 75% and 75% is literally the passing line for a class. So mm -hmm. I went into the final with a 75% and you know, I was going through the questions and I was like, okay, okay, like this is fine, this is okay. Um, but I remember um, it was a 50 question, fi 50 question final and then like I was skipping all the questions that I wasn't sure on and I was just kind of putting a little dot next to like the answer that I thought it might be just so I could come back to it later. And so up through to maybe question I don't know, like 45, and that's like when they, the proctor's like, okay, time's up, you guys want to turn your chest Ooh. in, and I was like, oh, oh no, my no. god, <laughs> I'm on the border, and I'm oh, not god. feeling good, <laughs> so I like quickly went through the last five questions, I was like, yeah, I think I just went with my gut, yeah, I think so, I think so, I think so, I think so, and then I still had about like another seven questions I had skipped, and I was like, oh man, <laughs> this is not good, <laughs> oh no, so anyways, I I went back to them and I, I basically just circled the ones that I had put a dot on to because I was like, I'm just going to go with whatever my gut thought at the time. Mm -hmm. Turned in my test and then um, I think he, he was really good about putting in results and he put the results up about like two hours later. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that I did after that final was um, me and all the other guys in my cohort, we all went to Corette and we, we were playing like five on five. And so like, um, I think midway after we finished a set or whatever, we went back to the bench, you know, and we were all looking out for our phones. Roll, and you know how it always is. It's like, oh, grades, 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 yeah. grades, scores, scores, you know. <laughs> and so, like, I, I went immediately to my phone. Um, the first one that I, I think the first thing that I read on my phone was actually a grade from something else, like a HESI or something. And it was like below 75. And I was like, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I thought I didn't pass. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, no, I was looking at the wrong one. And I actually looked at my actual score, and I passed. Hey. And, um, I don't remember what I passed with, I, but I, it was, like, below 80, but above 75, so I passed. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's hard. Um, that's when I really started feeling the heat. And, you know, but after that, you know, like you just keep relying on your, your friends as support. I mean, mm -hmm. that playing basketball really helped a lot because yeah. it kept my mind off of what just happened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And with all that struggle or obstacles you said you had with Hesse, uh, if you could go back to like your, pro your past self in nursing school, what kind of advice would you give yourself in terms of Hesse? Because, you know, I'm a junior too. My first Hesse's coming up. So, you know, it's kind of nerve wracking. Um, advice with Hesse, um, to, you know, to be honest, I don't, I feel like I didn't actually like really, really, really nail down like the recipe for how to attack it until senior two, like for the exit one. Mm -hmm. Um, but what worked for, so I guess I'll tell, I'll just tell you what worked for me for the exit Hesse. Um, mm -hmm. but what worked for me was, well, so I actually didn't get my clinical placement until, like a week before HESI. So all the way up until that point, it was a pretty chill semester because uh, all I really had time for, I, I mean, all my time was just dedicated towards studying for it. Mm -hmm. um, now, but for me, what worked out was I took the HESI book. I don't know if you guys are using like a green book now or like a red book or, or mm -hmm. what it is, but mm -hmm. I took that book um, and I went through the adult, all the, the, all the adult sections, um, and then the pediatric sections. Um, and then I just kind of, I opened up a word document and I started, so I graduated in winter. So I started like my last, maybe like half a month of summer vacation. And I just kind of just went through the book and did like one page a day or two pages a day and just kind of like rewrote it just so that it made a little more sense to me. Mm -hmm. And so by, by maybe September or something like that, I had had the whole book kind of, or at least the sections that I thought were the adult and the peed sections, had it all rewritten so that in a sense that made, that worked for me. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just go based off of that and I started ignoring the book. So I did that, that helped a lot, um, mm -hmm. just condensing it in my own words, in my own language. And then the other thing that really helped for me is, um, you know, realizing that, you know, Hesse doesn't have to dominate my world. Like mm -hmm. I have other things, like I can go to a coffee shop, I can go somewhere else, I can go play basketball, I can go work out, or mm -hmm. I can do something else. Um, I don't have to make this be the center of my world. I have a whole bunch of different aspects of my life that I can address. And Hesse doesn't have to be the end all be all one big everything uh, of mm -hmm. my life. Um, other things, um, just hmm, breathing. Yeah, <laughs> breathing. It's, it's, hard. it's hard because sometimes when you're in the room, um, it's just you you just go so laser focused on the question that's literally right in front of you um you don't have to you know you don't have to feel all that pressure i know it's a lot easier said than done but um yeah. i think something that helps you to realize that is you know when you are working as a nurse you know you're not going to go into a patient's room and you're not going to see like you're not going to see like question bubbles come up like <laughs> oh like they have they're, they're having shortness of breath they're having a tight tight chest they're having uh pain 10 out of 10 or whatever you know you're not going to see that come up in bubbles that's mm -hmm. going to have to come from here and based yeah. off what you see mm -hmm. and not only that but when you see those types of things um even if you recognize it bubbles aren't going to come up and be like okay so do you want to do a like draw your opponent do you want to do b i don't know uh, raise the head of the bed you know see everything has to come from here mm -hmm. um, and just realize that realizing that HESI and how you do on HESI isn't going to actually even determine like how you're going to be as a nurse mm -hmm. so that yeah. kind of helped to minimize the pressure of HESI and, and just realizing that it's just a test you know mm -hmm. um, I think that's a like very that. important perspective yeah and, is, oh, yeah sorry oh no it's yeah. um you know even if you're like a good test taker, bad test taker, you know, none of it's going to ultimately, ultimately matter because you're going to be trained as a nurse. You're going to have someone hopefully to help guide you. Um, and so that you can kind of gain your own perspective on like what's good practice. Mm -hmm. um, so it, this is just one of those things that's, it's, it's here. You just got to get mm -hmm. through it. You know, yeah. it's more of a, um, it'll happen. You just mm -hmm. got to take the necessary steps that you need to, to get through this. And then you go on to the next one, which is like a job interview or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's just another thing that's in the way. Yeah. Toby, do you have any advice? Oh yeah. Sorry about that. Oh no, I, I just think it's so important um, that you talk about self care because I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. So how do you, you know, now that you're a nurse, how do you stay sane and how do you de-stress and, you know, kind of let that, let that go or keep it um you know in the hospital when you leave you know how do you not take all of those things with you oh it's oh it's definitely it's that's something that i did i mean i still do it now but mm -hmm. it happened a lot more frequently when i first started out as a nurse because you take you take every little minute detail and you ingrain it in your head it's like okay like what, did I do that right? Did I do that wrong? You know, but you know, over time you it just, just the experience. And I think the exposure to being in the hospital setting and having like your own set of patients helps to, you know, I don't know about numb it, but just you, you get used to it, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, something that helped me with um, not taking things home is just thinking like, okay, did, did my patient die? okay, cool. They didn't die. So like, you know, like <laughs> relax. <laughs> it's not, mm -hmm. any, they didn't die. Did they get what they needed? Like, did you get all their meds? Did you, you know, did you hand off report to the army nurse? Cool. You did that, you know, just taking, not really focusing so much on all like the little, like the little details, like this was a failure. That was a failure. This was a failure. And more just saying like, well, I did this. That was good. You know, like I got that done in a pretty timely manner. That was good. And just recognizing more, what, what were your strengths on that shift? Like, what did you do right? You know, because mm -hmm. I feel like it's so, it's really, it's too easy to, 
focus on all the, on all like the mess ups and the mistakes and the things that you did wrong, mm-hmm. um, rather than it is to just recognize your own strengths and your own successes. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's yeah. so important to focus on, you know, the positive things and not focus on the things you didn't do, but really the things you did do things that were good. And then when you did miss something, you know, looking to do it better next time rather than beating yourself up because mm-hmm you forgot to report, you know, their input or output and then mm-hmm. only focusing on that, right? Focusing on the yeah. things you did, did do, you know, your strengths. And that, I think that's just so important yeah. to focus on. Yeah. Cause I feel like once you focus on so much of your weaknesses, rather than taking the steps to work on your weaknesses and make them strengths, you kind of just become so obsessed with the weaknesses that they never change and you mm-hmm. start it starts getting building up into your head until you eventually burn out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like that's something that I'm always worried about. And I think that I need to start getting that into my head where coming out of clinical every day, like debriefing with your uh, block and doing your journal, it's all about, you know, letting that go. I think the most important thing that I've learned, like, like in sophomore year is letting those tiny little details and overthinking go. Mm-hmm. And just realizing, realizing that even though you okay, you did have some failures, you did make some mistakes. It's most important that you're learning from them because when you once you learn from a mistake, it turns into a lesson. But if mm-hmm. you never learn from it and just let it eat you up inside, it's always just gonna be a mistake. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot about like how do you view it? Are you viewing it as a mistake, or are you viewing it as like an opportunity to get better? Yeah. So I mean, you know. And, I feel like everybody goes through it. Um, I went through it in, in Capstone because, like, there would be some shifts that I was literally, like, crying on my way back. I was like, shit, mm-hmm. man, like, <laughs> I screwed that one up, you know, or I didn't do this, I didn't do this good enough. Um, but that's just um, part of the growing process, I think. And, you know, you just have to – it's about rearranging your mindset around mm-hmm. these, things, these types of things to um, help benefit your growth, as, help benefit your growth rather than having it be something that helps to stunt it. Mm-hmm. And it's so yeah. important, that perspective, you know, mm-hmm. like mistakes are only your mistakes if you don't learn from them. But they, mm-hmm. if, if you do learn from them, they, they can kind of, you know, become your biggest teachers. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I'm just curious, Patrick, like what was that transition like going from nursing school and then applying and becoming like an actual nurse? Oh, um, that part was really different um, just because I feel like with school you have like with school, I mean, there's, there's, I guess I'll say like, there's more black and white. Like you kind of know how your day, how your day is going to go. Like I know that I've got a test next week. I know that I've got class that I have to go to tomorrow morning at eight o'clock or whatever. Like, you know, those things you have, um, you know, I know that I'm going to be seeing my friends in class too. And you know, there's all those things that you know, Whereas mm-hmm. with working, I guess it's different because, or, well, not even just working, but just applying to jobs. It's like, you get up in the morning, you have to push yourself to be the one to actively search for jobs that have openings, um, actively pursue emails that you have to reply to. That's all on you. You have to push yourself to do those kinds of things. So it's definitely mm-hmm. different. Um, I mean, you still have to push yourself to go to class and stuff, but I guess it's just, um, you know, I guess it can be easy when you don't have like set schedules to just kind of lay in bed and not do not want to do anything i mean that's how it was for me for a little while as a new dad was i was just in bed and i was like wow I got, like i have literally nothing planned and it's just on me to get out there and you know hunt for jobs do those kind of things fix my resume polish it um but it's not like it's those aren't like assigned things that i have to do yeah. Um, it'll affect me like uh, like grades and stuff like that so it's just different um mm. and it's hard because you you're not in like physical contact with your friends as much because you're not seeing them on a regular basis mm-hmm. but you still keep in touch with like texts you know all those kinds of things so it's just a little different mm. do you feel like it's like that discipline and the motivation motivational skills you learned in nursing school that kind of helped you get out of that rut and start you know applying for those jobs and getting into uh, like becoming a registered nurse. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the, yeah, the motivation from nursing school helped. Um, 
just keep me going after mm-hmm. post, like in post grad in the post grad phase um, because I realized that yeah like, I either, I went all through all of this stuff in nursing school you know like you gotta you gotta make your degree work yeah you can't just have a degree and say like oh I have it you know you gotta mm-hmm. push yourself a little bit so um, all through through everything in nursing school and all the work that you put in is being able to look back and like say like oh I did that you know mm-hmm. what's I did this I did I passed exit HESI so what's going online and you know finding a job opening to just submit my resume to what's that compared to exit HESI you know Mm -hmm. and I feel like another thing about motivation I that I've learned throughout just going to school is that sometimes instead of just being so focused on yourself I think you have to look at a bigger picture and kind of find some sort of external motivation like I remember in like when in high school where it was like track or something like my motivation to like work hard and keep doing better wasn't so that I could have my own personal gains and like PR or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think it was just trying to not let my team down. It got to a point where I was just working so hard so that I didn't let my teammates down. And I think now I'm trying to, I've applied that in nursing school so that now when I think of it, I don't want to let my patients down mm-hmm. or my future patients down in the future. Cause all the work I'm doing right now, whether or not I remember it, it's still helping me develop the work ethic and discipline that's going to carry over into my future. And I think, yes, you know, I can, you know, I'm like in the, well, not quarantine, but like just stay at home. I got to do all this and that, but I'm like super unmotivated. But I think one thing that I want everybody who's listening to know is that sure, you know, it's easy to sit down right now, but I think you just kind of have to look at the bigger picture and see that there are a lot of patients lives that are going to be in your hands and are going to be in your responsibility. And I think it's just important to know that the work you do right now, it still matters. Mm-hmm. Even if you, regardless of whether or not you're going to remember in the future. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, so it's a lot of it's about, kind of, it's trying to find that, inner, that motivation within yourself, even if you don't, even if it's not like door number one, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, well it's here, it's behind door number two. You just got to keep pushing yourself. So it's hard. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a good um, transition into kind of what's happening right now um, with a a lot of nurses and healthcare professionals on the front lines really having to deal with this ethical dilemma of weighing their safety and the care of their patients, right? With mm-hmm. these shortages of protective equipment, not having enough N95 masks or surgical masks even, having to do makeshift thing, you know, how do you, uh, I guess, what is your take on, on that situation with a lot of people who are being threatened with unemployment, should they refuse an assignment without the proper equipment, you know, whereas before, I think a lot of us took for granted the abundance of equipment that we had, not fearing to, of running out of a mask or a gown, and now people mm-hmm. are literally having to hold on to one mask for their whole career until this pandemic is over. So like, what's my perspective on the PPE shortage, basically? On the PPE shortage and also just the ethical dilemma of how do you navigate weighing your safety and your health and your family's health with your, you know, role as a nurse? Yeah. Yeah. I mean... I think it's, I'm not going to lie, I think it's really messed up that, you know, so basically CDC guidelines, like, I, like originally they were saying like, like airborne and then for them to go from airborne to, oh no, just, you know, regular Dropper. mask is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, to now it's like, yeah, like you got a bandana, you got to stop. <laughs> it over, you know? like, yeah. it, it, it's just really weird to me. Um, so basically the, what they're saying now uh, maybe it could, maybe I could be wrong. Maybe it could be something different right now, but what they're saying right now is like, if your patients got a trach, if they're on high flow, high flow, if they're uh, to doing that, if they're with any nebulizers, things like that, then you use an N95. Otherwise you use a surgical mask. So to me, that's just, it doesn't make sense to me because by saying that you're acknowledging that, yes, this virus is airborne transmissible. Um, but then you're also saying like, 
but you know, if they're not on those types of things, then just use a surgical mask. So you're basically being really controversial. Um, mm. And the way that I view it is, I, if I want to, if I'm going to deal with a patient that's, you know, even a potential case, like I want to use an N95, like I don't want to just be unprotected and then, mm-hmm. you know, come home and then expose all that stuff to family, friend or family right now, you know, not friends, but, you know, just to expose that to my family. So I even thought about, um, with one of my other friends, we were both nurses and we were seriously considering, um, just moving out for the time being and like, him and I were going to split a place just to self isolate ourselves from our families. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, we're not going through with that route, but we just really, we're really concerned about safety. Um, And for us to be in the shortage that we're in right now is kind of interesting because it's like, damn, we're in the year 2020 and being in a shortage of masks is really a thing especially with those N95s, like they're expensive as hell, but you know, for us to be in a shortage of them uh, in a crisis time, like Mm -hmm. it really sucks, you know? Um, But it also, I think having the shortage really does make you appreciate um, PPE a little bit more as weird as that sounds like Mm -hmm. the, I guess when I, when I first started out and you know how gloves are always on the wall and you pick out one glove, what happens? You pick out one glove and then two of them fall on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It always happens, right? But you then now that when now when that happens to me, and it still does, there's still let me tell you this, there's no there's no single technique to get a single glove out. That that mm-hmm. that will always be hard. Let me just put that out there. Yeah. But um, you know, but when those things happen when like you take one glove and then two of them fall on the ground, you know, I think about it a little bit more like, wow, like <laughs> that was kind of a waste, but mm-hmm. it it's PPE is really, really valuable, and I think the situation has definitely brought, brought um, I guess, efficient. Uh, what am I trying to say? Supply efficiency mm-hmm. into the, into the light a little bit more. Yeah. Um, it really does know, humble you. Yeah. PPE and the shortage. Yeah, that's it's such a it's such a tough position, and to you know look back on times where you maybe didn't use your PPE the most effectively, you know, walking into a patient's room just to check on them, putting Mm -hmm. on gloves, taking them off, and then five minutes later coming back to that same room and doing the same thing again. And Mm -hmm. then really thinking of how can you bundle your care so that you're using as little as possible. And really, you know, for a lot of us, I know there were a lot of nurses that I was um, reading their experiences on how they were, you know, disgusted at themselves before thinking back to a time where they had been wasteful with their PPE and now with every single piece being so precious. And I think Mm -hmm. that's really such an ethical dilemma, you know, to have hospitals and physicians who are telling their staff to, even if a patient is coding, to not go in unless you have the 10 minutes to properly gown, glove, mask, Mm -hmm. goggles even, to make sure you have the maximum protection because we have healthcare providers who are being exposed to so much that they're now getting sick without even prior medical history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, really, um, for anyone who's listening, you know, to really be thankful and grateful to you know, people like you who are working and being exposed and dealing with this every single day now and to be hearing about people who are and not treating um, healthcare professionals with the most, with any respect. Um, mm-hmm. Nurses who are being sprayed with Lysol as they're leaving the hospital in clean scrubs. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's definitely putting the um, field in a different light and perspective during mm-hmm. this time. Yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, what I'm mostly like interested in and seeing is seeing like how the, I guess the nursing world, no, not even just the nursing world, but how the nursing world and also just general healthcare, healthcare, healthcare providers, how they're viewed after this whole thing passes over and after it's, after it's gone, because, you know, you see people like celebrities and athletes glorified and, you know, because Mm -hmm. they, they provide drama, they provide whatever it is that they're on. Um, And just, I'm, I'm just interested to see like how, healthcare providers are um, 
view afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you see a bunch of things now that like free Krispy Kreme, free coffee, free Allbirds, free crops, yeah. free I know, yeah, that's kind free, of literally all these things. And I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that I want it free afterwards. I'm just, it's just, it's, I think it's just an interesting, an interesting thing to see now mm -hmm. uh, with everything that's going on. No, I definitely agree. I remember like, cause like most nights I just like go with my family to see like the Channel 2 News or whatever. And a lot of times before this pandemic, you would just see a lot of stuff about celebrities, this and that. Mm -hmm. But then now you kind of, they really focus on the world of healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I think it just really just contributes to how nursing is one of the most respected prof professions in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just going to carry on forward from here. I don't know if it would really, I'm sure it will transition back to maybe the world of drama and like celebrities and all that. But I think um, this pandemic has definitely had a lasting effect of how people have and will continue to view those in the medical field. And hopefully it does inspire a lot of people to go out there and just help out other people, you know, contribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how I mean, mean, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, no, it's, it's all good. Um, how has, you know, what nursing means to you? How has this whole situation, you know, if, if it has changed and how has it affected how you view, you know, healthcare? Because I'm hearing of a lot of nurses who are really past the breaking point, people who are, after this is all over, really having to consider if they even want to continue staying in the field and people who are already because of how tough the situation is and just how high stress and how taxing it is on them and, and their families and their health, really considering, you know, leaving the profession completely and not looking back. I mean, I think it, I think the whole situation right now is just kind of propagated what we learned in nursing school about how the United States is so far behind in mm -hmm. the realm of healthcare comparing, compared to other countries. Um, I don't have like the statistics on me right now, but like if you looked at the number of cases that we have and the number of cases that other countries have and, you know, like the death rate and all that kind of stuff, it's just an interesting ratio. But then you also have to take into account how we're only, you know, we're only recently ex increasing the number of testing that we're doing. Um, there's a bunch of different factors, but it's just, uh, I mean, the shortage is one thing, you know, if you look at that and like, wow, that's like a, that's a, that's a miss on our part. We shouldn't be having a shortage. Um, so there's a lot of things that the situation is bringing to light, but I guess if there's any, um, uh, what am I trying, what's the word for it? If there's any good, good thing like silver lining it's yeah is it silver lining is that at least it's pointing out these issues to the public mm. and to everybody that like look this is a problem look this is happening um and it, and yeah it's a severe way to kind of bring light to a situation to bring light to problems that we have in the healthcare setting but at least it's being put out there and it's being oh, taken yeah, seriously for sure. or at least a little more serious than it was before mm. so like for us nursing students, you guys are just like people at home. Do you just, do you have any tips on how to stay calm during all this is like mass hysteria and just how mm -hmm. we keep moving forward? Getting your facts right and making sure that you're able to tell between fact and fiction um, and staying indoors. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of people that I still, that I'll still be seeing that are like, like mostly going to work actually. So, cause going for, going to work for me, uh, involves going along Ocean Beach and you still see a ton of people out at mm -hmm. the beach or, you know, even at Golden Gate Park. Um, mm -hmm. you still, like, I'll see on the outskirts of Golden Gate Park, like there's still a ton of people outside of their houses and just kind of like, oh, like, well, it's not working. So I guess we'll go outside and enjoy the weather. And it's like, mm, stay indoors. Like mm -hmm. you're just, you're just only elongating this situation. Mm -hmm. and it's not going to make it any better mm -hmm. um, I so feel I like, oh sorry oh no i was just saying like i don't know if it's like a silver line but i feel like 
even I think it's still important for people to I guess get some fresh or fresh air and like exercise. Yeah. But I think it's yeah. important to like make sure you're practicing social distancing and yeah. not going into those crowds and thinking, oh, you know, I'm young and healthy. Yeah. I won't get it. I'm sure people will still get it. And mm-hmm. even though you might not be concerned if you get it, I think the the major concern is like spreading it to those who are elderly or who mm-hmm. are immunocompromised or who have respiratory problems already. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's that for sure. And like also just now that there's cases that are popping up of like younger demographics being affected now, it's like, well, shit, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I guess as far as like staying calm about it, it's just stay to stay calm. I don't know. I like to stay connected. So any mm-hmm. like friends of mine, FaceTimes and all that all that good stuff you know things mm-hmm. that'll keep make that that'll keep you sane and it's it always goes back to that same theme of like relying on each other and like you know having each other's backs like my friends we talk on a regular basis and that even just even just waking up to like group text and seeing seeing them talking is just like okay cool mm-hmm. like you're still there you know mm-hmm. you're still with me and we can still joke around and it won't you know it's not this is just a temporary thing just kind of ingraining that in your head even if you don't necessarily believe it Mm -hmm. yes yeah and then for all of the you know there's um there's a petition going around for the governor to you know take action for those of us especially as nursing students who a lot of us are on the cusp of graduation you know with I think the number is 14,000 nursing students who may not be able to graduate on time with this whole situation going on. You know, is there any way for those of us who are at home, like what can we do? How can we help? Because I think a lot of people are, you know, myself included in a lot of ways, feeling helpless during this whole situation, hearing about nurses who are really sacrificing their lives doctors nurses everybody sacrificing their lives to to fight this you know how do we do our part aside from social distancing aside from staying at home washing our hands avoiding touching mm-hmm. our face and minimizing the spread is there anything else that we can do to be helping um i mean donations is probably the huge the biggest thing right now because of the shortage um i think other hospitals are more affected right now than mine but you know any donation will help um just keep providers safe um, mm-hmm. so donations and also just making sure that you, you spread the word that like, yo, you know, stay indoors. Um, it's, yeah, it sucks to have to be stuck at home all the time, but you know, what's, what's being stuck at home versus propagating what's going on right now and elongating the situation and mm-hmm. putting other people's lives at risk. Um, mm-hmm. you know, really you just try to minimize the amount of time that you're actually going and outside and try to keep it for just the necessities, groceries, you know, things like that, pharma, like getting medications or whatever it is that you need to do. Um, yeah. I mean, those two things really are propagating the message of staying indoors and also um, just donations really. <laughs> and when, uh, what do you guys think about, cause I don't, I think I've heard it on the news recently about the possibility of, fourth year nursing students being called in to help out like Toby what do you think about like what do you think about that um I think there's a lot of us who really at this point want to be given the opportunity to do Mm -hmm. something um I know in some states like New York and even in Washington students are being pulled a lot of them against their will um to to fight this Mm -hmm. um and without, you know, proper equipment, and that's especially dangerous, but I think being given the, the option and the opportunity, um, I think is huge, because this really is at a point where I think a lot of it needs to be voluntary, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's tough to say, hey, you won't graduate, you won't get your diploma, unless you go and fight on the front lines, not only endangering yourself, but your family, but Mm -hmm. for a lot of us, the question becomes, can we graduate and be licensed by June, which at mm-hmm. this point, with the requirements being what they are, the answer is pretty much no. Mm-hmm. Um, and no one's saying that because everything is still up in the air and things are changing at a moment's notice. Mm-hmm. But you know, with that being with that being said, at least for me personally, you know, this is a lot of people are saying, you know, this isn't what we signed up for. We didn't sign up to be 
you know, sacrifice for that. And that's true. But at the same time, I went, you know, I went through nursing school for these four years to be able to serve. And, you know, if, if called upon, I would not hesitate to, to jump in and hope, just pray and hope that I have the protective equipment, Mm -hmm. but it, I think sucks more to be, to be stuck at home and know that I could probably be able to help but Mm -hmm. at the same time not be able to because of you know clinicals getting canceled not meeting the requirements and having it to be 75 percent in-person clinicals Mm -hmm. and you know i feel for the sites you know the hospitals are doing a good job and they're they are right to minimize the contact of students you know with every student that's there that's extra ppe that's being used Mm -hmm. i think at this point everyone the the number one thought on a lot of people's minds is we're literally months away from potentially being licensed and being able to work and while we don't have the experience Mm -hmm. every week more and more nurses are going to be falling left and right and with us already being short beforehand it's kind of just the how do we help right Mm -hmm. which is at the core of kind of what we learn in, in nursing school, which is how, how can we help other people? And especially now, how do we help other nurses and healthcare professionals? Mm-hmm. But I feel like at the same time, even like aside from the problem being us, like nursing students being called in as like maybe possibly like sacrificing more PPE, I think there is a huge problem with liability that the hospitals are like super worried about. Mm-hmm. And that, that too, yeah. Um, and I think the, the biggest thing is really just about safety at this point. Like, mm. n- nobody, nobody is safe, and it, it really sucks. But it, I think it's just, it's, just, it's just so hard to hear these, these stories, especially of nurses in New York, um, and even in, in abroad, people who are so stressed to the point where you know, people are losing lives, not directly related to getting the the virus, but as collateral damage, you know, um, people who aren't getting care that they need. And it's just to be, you know, you just, you just, you just want to help. And it, it, it's definitely a dangerous situation. I think for, for me personally, being someone who is immunocompromised, you know, if I, you know, I would fall under the high risk, but I think mm-hmm. that that's just, the the number one thing that I want to do right now is to be given an opportunity to help and mm-hmm. to, to serve. And that's, you know, that's, I think what I want most out of this is to be given that opportunity and chance, because if we're delayed now, that's 14,000 potential nurses being delayed nine months and who knows what will be at that point. Mm-hmm. Patrick, what's your perspective on that? Like as a nurse, do you feel like there is a need right now for, nursing students to be called upon to help out um i don't from my own hospital's perspective and setting i think we're i mean i think we're like i guess with staffing wise we just hired like a ton like five more people on night shift so Mm -hmm. i I feel like i feel like we're okay but um my take on I guess calling upon like nurses, nurses and maybe expediting getting their license and all that kind of stuff. It, I don't know, you know, I don't know the details and the red tape behind all that, all that stuff. But my biggest concern is just okay, hospitals that are taking in like potential students who are potentially getting their licenses expedited. Like, what's the training look like for them mm-hmm. with the whole situation yeah. and like the influx of patients at the same time, like are you guys being trained appropriately and sure it's probably, maybe it won't be ideal because of what's going on, but like, can we at least get you adequately trained enough where you're going to be safe? That's just my take on it. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's about patient safety, right? And so weighing the, the benefits and the downsides of doing that, but you know, as patients are surging, as hospitals are going to, you know, 150, 200, 300% capacity, even what it, it's like weighing, having one nurse with way too many patients, and then also having someone who's inexperienced. Um, 
taking on a, a smaller load and you know the dangers of that versus the dangers of the other and it's just overall i think it's just a tough situation and everything's changing at a minute's notice really mm-hmm. um do you guys have any final words of encouragement or anything tips to for our listeners yeah, patrick do you have anything to to leave with everyone as you know as we're nearing the the end of this this podcast is there anything that you can you know give people at this time mm, god <laughs> um just stay safe you know um and really i guess totally not really addressing like nursing just you know appreciate the relationships that you have right now be it with your family or with your friends um and just support each other I don't know. There's, I mean, I feel like this situation has made me realize personally that like, there's a lot of like friendships that I have from nursing school, especially that like you live, like you live in San Jose, you don't live that far away from me. Like, and Mm -hmm. I haven't really kept in touch with you or, Mm -hmm. or you know, I haven't really Mm -hmm. maintained our friendship or done my part to maintain our friendship. So it's made me appreciate it a lot more. Um, only trying to reconnect with people who I haven't for a while. Um, Mm -hmm. So stay safe and uh, really appreciate the relationships that you have currently. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's very easy, I think, being out of physical touch to maintain those uh, relationships with people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then um, before we end, I really just want to take the time to thank everyone who's who's listening and or even people who aren't listening for just staying at home doing your part to really helping to flatten the curve social distancing washing your hands avoiding touching your face um anyone who's been donating you know usf donated a bunch of equipment to saint mary's and ucsf um and then also just really throwing out a thank you you know a sincere thank you to patrick and everyone you know, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, a- any healthcare professional out there who really are doing above and beyond what is being asked of them when they, you know, initially signed up to join this profession. I think it's mm-hmm. amazing the people who are at the front doing all of this and making it possible for us to, you know, be at home, be to be healthy and alive to even appreciate what's going on mm-hmm. yeah thank you patrick for you know taking the time out of your schedule to help us out i appreciate and i think i've both toby and i and probably the listeners have learned a lot from your story at usf and beyond and you know if you ever want to come back to the podcast let us know yeah definitely thanks for having me you guys yeah but yeah thank you that's uh, the second podcast wrapping up yes uh, let's see.